Are miracles happening today? Let's find out what the Bible says. But first, if you're interested in an answer to this question, but only have a minute, please check out our short on this topic. People often use the word miracle to describe just about every event that can happen in their lives, from finding lost money to a child being born to recovering from sickness or surviving a, a, a car accident or any number of things. People will just say it's a miracle. People of faith, when they say that, they usually mean it's something that God did for them. But is that actually biblical? Does the Bible teach that miracles are or are not happening today? We're going to make four points to try and answer that question from what the Bible says. Number one, in order to have this conversation, it is paramount that we properly define the word miracle. Because if we use it the way that it's used in our vernacular, then yes, of course, miracles are happening all the time. They happen in people's lives on a daily basis. And yes, then miracles are happening. The problem is the way that we use the term miracle and the way that the Bible uses the term miracle, not the same. You see, the Bible uses the term miracle in conjunction with the words sign and wonder. Sometimes you'll th see all three of them together in, in, in a triplet saying miracles and signs and wonders were done. Acts chapter 5 is a good example of that. When the Bible is using that term in a technical manner, which it almost always is, it's not describing the ordinary events of life that may be unexplained or just amazing as we behold them. Like childbirth. It's amazing to behold. It's incredible, unexplainable in so many ways, but yet it happens daily. Day after day after day, babies are born. Not a Bible miracle. From the biblical text, the term miracle refers to special acts of God, where God clearly inserts himself into the flow of history, into the flow of time, into nature, and changes events so as to announce his presence or his endorsement of either an act, a message, or a person. So he would have Jesus there in Acts chapter 2. Peter would say about Jesus that he was a man who lived among the, the, the first century Jews who was approved by the works that he did. The gospel itself, the salvation proclaimed under the gospel, is said to have been confirmed by the Lord or sp spoken by the Lord and confirmed unto us who heard him. And then it goes on to say in verse number four of Acts, Hebrews 2, that the Lord also bore witness to this salvation in the gospel by signs and wonders that he did and various gifts of the Holy Spirit. So that's a Bible miracle, something that is used to announce the presence, the endorsement of God with a person, an act, or a message. Number two, we need to understand this. In the Bible, those, quali those, those events, those miracles, signs, and wonders are actually quite rare. Now, there are a few times, like the, the, the creation itself, you could call that a miracle, I suppose. You could call maybe the flood of Noah a, a miracle in its beginning. But in terms of actual miracles that were performed, where God said, here I am, I'm doing this. You know, the first time that any human actor is involved in the, in the performing of a miracle is not until the time of Moses as we deal with the book of Exodus. Now, the book of Genesis spans at least some 1,500 years or so from the creation until the, the close of its 50th chapter. So for 1,500 years, there is not a recorded miracle from a human actor that God was using to perform these miracles that we find anywhere in the first 1,500 years of the Bible. Even in the Old Testament, the rest of the Old Testament, there are two prophets who were prolific in terms of their miracle use, Elijah and Elisha. Together, they only performed in their decades of, of prophetic ministry about 21 miracles as recorded in the Bible. Still not a lot over the decades of their service. In general, throughout the pages of the Bible, miracles are quite rare. Number three, there is a period of time in the Bible when there is an explosion in the presence of miracles. You turn to Acts chapter 2, where we have just after the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, as, as was recorded in the end of the gospel accounts. And then, of course, you have his ascension back to heaven in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 2, we go to the first Pentecost after his resurrection. The gospel is now being preached for the first time. And as an endorsement of that gospel message, Peter says that the events of that day are the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel back in Joel 2, 28 through 32. In that period of time, Joel said that the God would outpour his spirit from heaven 
and people would dream dreams, they would prophesy and they would see visions. Along with that, we have the other gifts we know about in the New Testament, tongue speaking and healing and so on. That gift is said to come upon all flesh. So both Jews and Gentiles, even within that particular text in Joel 2, it says your sons and your daughters, your old men and your young men, and then also even upon your male and female servants. So young and old, male and female, rich, poor, doesn't matter. All flesh was going to have access to these. And as you read through the early days of the church, indeed, the apostles passed those gifts on to a plethora of people. And so all flesh, quote unquote, had access to the miraculous gifts in the first century. So yes, there is one period where miracles are everywhere. And it's probably that period that causes a lot of people to have the perception about the, the proliferation of miracles throughout the Bible. Number four, the Bible does describe and predict the end of miracles. In both the Old and the New Testament, there are passages which indicate that those gifts would fade away. For example, in Zechariah 13, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says that when the fountain for sin and uncleanness is open, that's Acts chapter 2, that's when it was open to the house of David, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that's exactly what's happening in Acts 2. He goes on to say that I will cause the prophet and the unclean spirit to pass from the land. So Zechariah's prophecy is that when the preaching of the gospel comes, obviously there's, there is that, that flash of that explosion, that flash of, of gifts that are outpoured, but that would indicate that gifts were now coming to an end once that period ended, because at that time, the prophet would leave the land and so would the unclean spirit. It also says then that demon possession is over. The prophet would pass from the land. Daniel chapter 9 describes a period of 70 weeks that are determined upon the city of Jerusalem and upon the Jews, the holy people. At the conclusion of those 70 weeks, it is said that the prophet or the prophecy, depending on your translation, would be sealed up. That indicates again some kind of ending to a prophetic age. In the New Testament, we have a statement in, in John chapter, or, uh, um, uh, Mark chapter 16. But the Lord continued with his disciples, the, the disciples that had these miraculous signs following them, Mark 16, verse 70. But he says in, in a combination of Matthew 28, verse 20, and Mark 16, and verse 20, the Bible says that the Lord went with them, confirming the word with signs following. That's Mark 16. Matthew's account says that period of time which the Lord went with them would not go until the end of time, but rather until the end of the age, the age in which they were currently living. Also, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul speaks of a time when revelation, knowledge that is given by the revelation of the Spirit, would come to an end. There would come a time when tongue speaking would come to an end. Ephesians chapter 4 says that, would, that there would also be an ending of the gifts that Jesus left the, the early church when we all come into the unity of the faith. So there are a plethora of verses, even more than we've listed, that describe a period of time after the cessation of of miraculous gifts. That time seems to be connected to the revelation of Scripture, among other things. 1 Corinthians 13 says, When that which is perfect comes, that which is in part shall be done away. That which is perfect is referring to the completed revelation of the Christ. That which is in part is that prophecy, that knowledge which comes in part through the various gifts of the Holy Spirit. So that point is behind us. It is well in our past, nearly some 2,000 years in our past. So as, as a biblical feature, as a statement of the New Testament text, the idea that biblical miracles is, are continuing would not be consistent with what we see in Scripture. No, biblical miracles do not occur today. Now, if you're using the term, as we said in the open, if you're using the term in a generic way, talking about wonderful things that God does, that's another question. Maybe something we should talk about in the future. But miracles, strictly from a textual standpoint, the Bible says, have come to an end.